Hello and welcome everyone to Digital Pages event on designing your ideal career path with best-selling author Kristen Sherry. Um, we are so excited to have you join us today. We've got an amazing conversation lined up for you. For those of you that have already engaged with Digital Page, welcome back. Really glad to see you again. And for those of you that are new, um, just a quick update on who we are. Uh, Digital Page is a nonprofit organization, and our goal is really to be a lifelong partner with you in helping individuals achieve the career path that they want within the tech industry. We're looking to change the face of this industry and really support the underrepresented. And that means everything from giving you access to individuals, your network, tools, skills, and just general information to really help you get to the next step of where you want to be. And with that, we think Kristen is the perfect partner to bring on board to have an in-depth discussion. And I have to say, I had the luxury of meeting Kristen in person, and she is just as amazing in person as she is online. So you are in for a special treat. Um, with that, I'm going to hand it off to Rashmili to kick off. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Amita. So hi, everyone. My name is Rashmili Vimula, and I'm the Director of Operations for Digital Page. As Amita mentioned, our fireside chat this afternoon is with Kristen Sherry. She is the creator of the UMAP framework, as well as the author of the book, UMAP, Find Yourself, Blaze Your Path, and Show the World. So again, as Amita mentioned, we'll be discussing the power of personal branding and self-discovery and how to create a fulfilling career and life that aligns with your strengths, values, and passions. So this is a unique opportunity to gain insights and value um, and to ask questions. Kristen is here for you. So uh, she's helped countless individuals all around the world find their unique purpose. So if you have a question, please use the chat function um, and our chat moderators will be able to get to your questions throughout the session or at the audience Q&A at the end. So without further ado, a little bit more about Kristen. Kristen Sherry is a globally recognized career expert with numerous awards. And like I said, she is the creator of the UMAP Career Profile, which uncovers the four pillars of career fit. She is an international speaker and 11-time author. So her book, UMAP, which I mentioned, is Amazon's number one international bestseller. She's also the manager, managing partner of UMAP LLC, which certifies coaches, career services, and HR professionals as UMAP coaches and workshop facilitators. She has certified professionals all over the world. She has also been a featured career expert on Wharton Business Radio, a disrupt HR speaker, and a contributor to the 2020 Career Industry Trends White Paper. Welcome, Kristen. Thank you, Rashmili. It's a pleasure to be here. Hello to everyone watching. Wonderful. So let's jump right in. I've mentioned your framework UMAP a few times already, but for those who may not be familiar with it, can you share a little bit of an overview of the framework itself? Sure. And I just want to give everyone a tip that if you don't have a pen, you should, because I'm going to give you tons of actionable tips and takeaways that you can do um, throughout this, this chat. So <laughs> grab a pen if you don't have one. So Years ago, when I became a career coach, I was having difficulty finding a tool that could give me a holistic view of a person. So I had used different personality assessments, which uncover people's traits and uh, characteristics about them. I had used the Clifton Strengths tool, which is part of UMAP, um, to discover people's talents. But people would sometimes say, Yes, these things are true about me, but no, that's not true about me. And I didn't have a, a way to understand why people were different than some of the assessments I was using. So I started to go into career forums, LinkedIn groups, Facebook groups, and ask the question, what tools are, are everyone using? And I noticed mostly it was personality assessments. So I undertook this journey and I interviewed about 2,000 people. And I asked them to tell me about the elements of a career that was very fulfilling to them or satisfying and careers that were absolute misery on a stick. <laughs> and so I started to write down all of the things people told me and then look for the patterns. 
And what I found was people who were either miserable or fulfilled in a career, the same things were going on. They just had a, a presence of those things or a lack of those things, right? And so there were four things. And that's where I came up with the four pillars of career fit. So the first is that you use your talent at work. So that's how you want to work because your talent really sets your priorities because you do it naturally. So we're going to prioritize relationship building, influencing others, getting results or thinking sort of the things that happen in our head. Those are the four things people tend to prioritize. So those strengths or how you work. The second pillar was really around a person's values, why you work, what's important to you. And Our values are what best explain what's important to us, really. And ideally, our strengths or our talents should express through those values. So if we value relationship building, we're going to build relationships in a way that matters to us according to our values, right? The third pillar that I discovered from what people were telling me, people started to talk about all this stuff about energy. I feel really drained at the end of the end of the day. I feel like I got hit by a bus. I just want to go home and get under the covers and sleep. And that energy thing was around our skills, what we're actually working on every day. That's where the rubber meets the road. What are the tasks that you're actually doing? Are you estimating and writing? Are you researching or studying? Are you organizing? Are you mentoring? Are you training? Are you selling? All the different skills people were using. That's how you spend your time. And then the fourth pillar was what everyone was doing already, the personality. And that was people talking about what they were interested in or what motivated them. So personality really shapes our interests in our work. And so ideally our interests should express through those skills. So for example, someone likes training or they like writing as a skill. But if you don't like to write about risk and compliance topics, you want to write about food or international travel, you won't like writing if you're writing about topics you're not interested in, right? So those four pillars came to light from what people told me. And that's how the UMAP framework was born. That's, that's amazing. So the career fit is a framework entirely of your own. That's a part of UMAP. So my question for you with the pillars that you'd mentioned, or maybe that is something with the framework uh, steps itself, but what do you, or as an individual looking to use this framework need to identify first? Is it the talent? Is it the values? Is it personality? Like which one? It's really difficult to where. So where should you start? Um, I I definitely think people should start with their talent. Uh, You you have to really look at all of those four pillars because otherwise it's a one legged stool. If you ever sat down on a chair with one leg, that doesn't really go well. So um, you could sit on a stool that had three legs. It'd be a little wobbly. But uh, but I would start with talent. And that's because it's the easiest thing because you're already using those talents in some way, but not with intention. And our talents are things we're born with. They're inherited from our biological mother and father, or maybe even from a grandparent. Sometimes things skip generationally, but they're in your DNA. Mm -hmm. And I won't go too deeply into that because I know you're probably going to ask me a question (laughs) that will uncover that. But I will say I would start with your strengths and your talents because that is the easiest thing because you'll have examples of having used them naturally already. Got it. That makes sense. So when it comes to identifying strengths, what are the typical steps or recommendations on how they can sit and and think through them? Is it as simply as reflecting or are there exercises that you would recommend? I'm glad that you asked that. So I always like to give people free options to to do things. If you don't want to to do a full UMAP, you can do a UMAP at myumap, M-Y-Y-O-U-M-A-P, myumap.com. But a free way to find out your talents is to ask people who know you well. You can send an email, a text. You can call people on the phone if anyone does that anymore. (laughs) I don't really pick up the phone much. I'm more of a texter. But you can ask people, tell me about a time that you observed me doing something that came naturally well to me and what impact did it have? So you'll remember that I mentioned that people prioritize building relationships, influencing people, getting results or thinking. So someone might say something about your relationship building. 
you're very, you listen so well and you're very non-judgmental. You might think that's not much of a skill, but that's what's called empathy. And in Silicon Valley, a lot of tech companies look for salespeople who have empathy because they call it the six figure soft skill. Empathy isn't really something you can teach people to, to feel, but they have found that when their salespeople have empathy, they have higher sales, higher customer retention, and they're more likely to get customers to buy again. So sometimes we have strengths that we don't think are a big deal or very important, but only one in 33 million people share the same top five strengths in what's called the Clifton Strengths Assessment that Gallup um, created. And that's what we use as part of UMAP. We do use the Gallup assessment in within embedded within UMAP. And then we have the other three pillars are proprietary tools that we've created. But I would say that when you are good at building relationships, really all of all of work is really about people. You can't do work without people. Mm -hmm. And so that's a real advantage. And you might feel like, oh, I'm good with people. Big deal. Mm -hmm. It is a really big deal. Just go read customer reviews <laughs> yeah. or negative reviews on glassdoor.com about companies. It's almost always people issues. They're, they're controlling, they have a toxic workplace culture, the management is weak. It's usually people complaints. They're not like, well, their product is really terrible, <laughs> <laughs> right? When they're yep. the former employees. <laughs> if, if you are good at influencing people, that's the most, that's the least frequent strength category that people have, the ability to communicate compellingly to move people to action, to persuade people to do things. It's really hard to get people to move and to act. And if you're good at doing that, that's a very valuable talent that you have. Companies yeah. tend to care a lot about results. Are you an achiever? Are you efficient in your work? Are you good at tr troubleshooting and finding solutions to problems? Are you, are you disciplined to create projects and break them down into manageable chunks to get work done? So companies tend to really value people's result oriented strengths. And it's difficult for young people when they have the thinking category of strengths, because what happens when you go into a job and you're a recent grad or um, you're, you're in college doing an internship, they want to give you things to do, right? Here's a spreadsheet to fill out. Here are things to sort. Here are numbers to analyze or whatever you're doing. But you might be very strategic seeing a lot of options and quickly determining which option is going to work best. You can you can figure out the end goal and work backwards in your mind and know what will work and what won't. Well, a lot of young people aren't given the opportunity to do strategic work. Uh, you might be a, a real idea generator. You might be a futuristic person who's quite visionary. You might be somebody who's very wise and people may have called you an old soul or that you're wise for your age because you have this ability to think so deeply. You might be very analytical and can figure out the truth of the matter, like what happened here to get down to the, the crux of the matter. There's a lot of different, you might be very resourceful and um, inquisitive and curious. And all of these are thinking strengths. And so knowing these things about you through feedback from someone else or through a strengths assessment is very valuable to have because you can present that to the hiring manager in an interview. You can also present those things to your new manager when you start a job so that they look for opportunities or you can find opportunities and say, you know, strategic is my number one strength. Do you think I could be involved in our company's strategic planning group? Or could I help with the strategy for our team for the coming next three years or, or whatever? If you can come up with ideas, it's easier for people to say yes, because confused people don't say yes. If you say, what are ways I can use my strategic? I can promise you they'll never take the time to think about it. So you think about it and you present it. And that's true for all of your strengths. What are ways you can implement those? So ask people you know in different contexts, what are things that you've seen me do or that you have noted about me that I seem to do well naturally and what's the impact that it had? And start to build your stories around that. And those stories should be through everywhere someone comes into contact with you. 
if you create a LinkedIn profile when you're young, you'll really stand out because 97% of recruiters use LinkedIn as their primary tool for looking for candidates. So if you do a little write-up based on your strengths, then they see your, your resume and you bullet out experiences you've had, internships where you had results or project work in, in school that your leadership strengths came out or your innovative ideas came out or your ability to collaborate well and help others collaborate well came out. Any of those things around relationships, influencing, getting results and, and thinking that you can think of, those results are in your resume. Those are stories you tell in interviews and they'll start to notice you have this consistent brand. What I saw on LinkedIn, what you shared in the interview, what your resume says is all emphasizing these things. And guess what? That's what we want in the job description because you're looking for opportunities that connect who you are. When you tell people, I'm a financial analyst grad, or that's that's telling people nothing about you. Mm -hmm. That's external to you. That's a job title. What about you as a financial analyst, as an engineering student, as a liberal arts major or fine arts or whatever you're doing? What is it that's different about you? That's what you want to focus on rather than the job title. Yeah. Can I go down a rabbit hole on that? No, that's, <laughs> you answered my next five questions basically. <laughs> but I, I really appreciate the breakdown there because I, and a comment to one of the things that you mentioned about why people leave jobs. It's not necessarily about a bad product that they're working on, right? It is the people, it is management, it is the maybe a lack of relationships or culture that people leave. So I, I think that's a, a great point that you made because people need to, or people in their careers are able to see that it's not just maybe their lack of interest in the job. It could be other factors that would really lead them to do something else. So on that comment specifically, if there's an individual who has figured out their strengths, but they don't necessarily match the role that they're in, what could they do that isn't necessarily a career change or a job pivot or company move? You alluded to it a little bit, but could we go a little bit deeper? Absolutely. That? So there are a few strategies um, there's good news and bad news. <laughs> there, I want you to picture a tree that has lots of leaves. It's, it's really abundant and it has deep, deep roots in the soil. That's a person, the roots represent, you have the natural talents, skills, interests, all of those things, those four pillars are in place. And so you have a lot of fruit that you see. Sometimes you see a lot of leaves, but sort of not very deep roots, that's when somebody is good at a job because they're compensating in some way. Maybe they're they're high achievers. Maybe they're highly responsible and accountable. So they're killing themselves to get the job done, but they're not really wired for it. Mm -hmm. Those are the people that eventually burn out or just say, I'm going to have a nervous breakdown. I can't do that anymore. And they just up and quit and everybody's shocked because they're so good at their jobs. So sometimes people are doing well, but they're compensating so much it's exhausting. So be careful of that. You're doing things that burn you out because you think you should because you're good at them. That's a huge caution. And I hope people wrote that down. <laughs> Then you have people who have very little leaves, but lots of deep roots. Well, this is strange because you thought you were wired for this. It fits your strengths. These are skills you have, but you're not doing well. Usually that person needs development. It could be that they didn't have good training. It could be that the job doesn't do exactly what they said it did in the job description. So if you're not performing well, but you tend to be normally good at the things they're asking for, it could be that they didn't properly train you. The manager doesn't know what the heck they're doing <laughs> or the job doesn't really do what what it was sold so in those cases the person really needs development and training so a mentor would be very appropriate in that case some some sort of development extra training it could be development resources that the company offers or that you could do independently but if you thought boy i really should be good at this but i'm struggling Development and mentoring is really the appropriate thing. When you have someone that has not very many leaves and they don't have the deep roots, all you can do in that situation truly 
is the role could be modified in some way. Um, finding a new job, either in the same company or outside of the organization. I mean, you can't take all of the things you're not good at and just get great at them. So it depends what percentage of the job. So if 80% of the job of the things you're doing are things that you could develop, then and 20%, not so much, the things are not so great at, and then you have to break those tasks into smaller chunks. So for example, if you're really not good at documentation and there's some of that in your job about 20%, then do half an hour every day instead of blocking off all day Friday to get your documentation <laughs> done because you'll get into that burnout mode very quickly and then you're ruined for the rest of the day or maybe it ruins your whole weekend. I remember when I first started at a career coach for as a career coach for a very small window, I wrote resumes and I could do nothing else for the afternoon if I wrote one in the morning because I was so burned out from doing it, it ruined my day. And I said, you know, this isn't worth it. I'm not doing this anymore. Yeah. So if a role, if, if a role doesn't fit you, you're planted in the wrong soil. So you could compensate by pulling some things out. Can I do more of this? Can I do less of that? And that's really the best you can do. The long-term strategy is to get out of that type of work. Yeah. Now I will tell you how to do that. Sometimes people say, that's all I've ever done. I went to school for engineering. All I can be is an engineer. I've interviewed for five jobs I've never had before and got all five because you can have transferable skills. What does that mean? It means there are skills you can pick up and drop into another setting and, and still do them do, do, regardless of job titles. So for example, if you know how to swim, but you've only ever swam in a four foot pool and you're five feet tall, you can stand up. Imagine if I pick you up and drop you into a six foot pool and you panic and you're kicking your legs and you can't touch the ground and you're saying, I can't do this. I've never swam in a six foot pool before. But then you kind of, I say, just relax. I'm your coach at the side. Just, you know how to swim. And you're like, oh, I can swim. Then if I grab you and now I put you in the ocean, you panic again, but you still know how to swim. So if you know how to do written communication and you know how to manage projects and you know how to mentor people or you know how to innovate or create or design or whatever the things you do, you can learn the other aspects. So what you do is you create an ideal day exercise. And a lot of people make the mistake that they don't have skills because they don't have experience. That is not true. You, you have had interpersonal skills going to college, going to trade school, working with your friends, going through the high school experience, um, volunteering, extracurricular activities, playing sports, you develop skills just there. For example, showing up on time every day. Um, employers care about that, believe it or not, that you show up and you show up on time and, you, and you're willing to work. If you have stories around that, Stories about being honest when it was difficult, taking responsibility, going above and beyond, um, all of those things matter. So how did you demonstrate leadership working on a project? And it's especially relevant if you've worked in any kind of nonprofit or volunteer work because you're not getting paid to be there and you have to deal with the difficulty of people and the frustrations working with people who don't really put a lot of value in it because they're not getting paid. So all of these experiences you've had, think about those, paid or unpaid, it doesn't matter. What are things that you enjoyed? I worked in a coffee shop when I was in high school, hated the job. I did not like customer service, but I loved listening to the stories of the regulars that sat around. And I learned, I loved listening and hearing people's stories. And as a coach, that was very interesting to me. Every person I would meet hearing their story, I loved that. So even if you hated a job, hated the volunteer work, or hated the project, or whatever you were doing, find something that you liked and write all those things down. And basically, you've created the job experience that you have actual experience and skills in to this point in your life. And build out those stories, and those become your interview points. So this one, one woman I was coaching, she was a senior executive at a credit card company. And I said, what are the things that you really loved? 
And she said, I loved solving problems. I liked collaborating with other groups in the business. I liked implementing things. I, I didn't want to come up with the ideas, but I loved implementing. And she went through all of this stuff. And I said, you know, that sounds like project management. This was an early conversation. She said, that's exactly what I used to do for a living. And I loved it. And I said, well, what happened? And I looked at her strengths and she had achiever and responsibility. People who are hard workers and take ownership for things get promoted because I can give you the work and it's going to get done and it's going to get done right. So she got promoted out of what she loved into things that she hated. So you have to advocate for yourself about not getting promoted out of what you love for the more money. And now you hate your life every day because the money's not going to be worth it if you hate what you're doing. So once you have that ideal day, you can start talking to people. What does this sound like? What are the types of things that come to mind when you see this? Use key words from your ideal day. So if you like strategizing and innovating and writing, plug those three words into a job board. What comes up? You never know. There's a really great website called Onet Online, O-N-E-T Online.org. It's powered by the Bureau of Labor Statistics, and you can search jobs on there. They tell you the type of interests people have, what they those jobs do day to day, the type of education background that you need, what are the actual work tap, work product. When you break that job down, what does it do? It can help you research. Talk to people you know who do those jobs. What is the job like? Because the academic environment is often very different. I had a 17-year-old cousin who said, I'm going to be a pharmacist someday. And I said, are you good at math? <laughs> because there's a lot of math. And she said, um, well, I want to be a pharmacist because they make bank. That's why she wanted to be a pharmacist. And I said, okay, just so you know, most people, when they become a pharmacist, they start at CVS and you're going to stand at a little window and listen to people talk about rashes they have on their body and what should you put on it. And it's a people job. Going through the academic experience, you're in the lab and you're in, and, and yes, some pharmacists go into pharmaceutical companies, but most of them start out at your corner CVS store hearing about Aunt Martha's rash. So... You've got to remember that the academic environment might be very exciting, but will the day-to-day -day be interesting to you? And that's where you need to talk to people to figure out what are the gaps between academic and actual job. Another rabbit hole for you there, Rishmeli. <laughs> no, no, no. I appreciate that. And I appreciate the multiple caveats you included regarding burnout and especially this last one about comparing academic and actual real-life corporate or real-life uh, medical roles, um, because when you are a student, which by the way, we have a student base when we work with digital page um, programs. So we have a, a nice audience base of those who are either going to college or looking for their first job ever. Um, I want to say that a lot of career uh, centers in these uh, schools or colleges don't necessarily share the comparison between when they go from academics to their first job, whether that is um, as a doctor, pharmacist, um, or even um, a leader within a corporate organization. So for the students here, what can you share with them regarding um, watching out for that? So I will say that um, in surveys, 17% of people find their career resource center helpful, which makes me sad. And a lot of that, I mean, they're very dedicated and passionate people, but by virtue of the fact that a lot of them went directly into the education system, they really don't know a lot about work environments outside of that. Mm -hmm. So yep. what end up, ends up happening is you get an academic approach to a real world problem, right? So what I would say to, to avoid those types of things is find a mentor now. There is going to be nothing that you do that will up your game as having a mentor and then mentor other people. You always want to be in the middle of a mentoring sandwich so that you take what you learn and you pay it forward to someone else. That's the best place to be. One of the number one values people have are is growth. That's the number one reason why people leave different companies. So Facebook once did a survey and people were leaving because they didn't feel they were growing enough. I don't know if they fixed that, but anyway, 
So when you get a mentor, you think about who is the person right now who's where I want to be next. Hmm. And then do I know anyone like that? Leverage your friends, family, professors, uh, people that you, customers, jobs you've had before. Who do you know? Ask people. Do you know anyone who got a job as a financial, as an accountant at KPMG, whatever it is you're trying to do. And then you ask people if they'd be willing to just speak to you for an hour a month. You have to own the mentoring relationship. You own setting up the meetings. You come to the table with what you want to ask and know. The mentor's role is to give you access to their network, to be an ambassador for you, to expand your agility in in that career path, um, be able to navigate things informally and informally, really give you advice. What are all the things you wish you knew when you started out? They, they should share those things with you. But you own the relationship in terms of what you want to get out of it. And then if that person you ask can't help, they might say, I just don't have time right now. You say, based on, on the goals, that I've stated of what I'm looking for in a mentor, who would you recommend to me? So you're not starting from scratch every time. And now you're tapping into their network to find somebody because birds of a feather flock together. They're going to know other people who are in similar circumstances or have had similar paths, whether it's someone else in the exact same job. If they're an executive, they work with other executives and you're looking for an executive. But I would say, try and find someone that's at least two levels above because they can really open your network. So I'll tell you a very quick story. I was an operations manager at one point in my career years ago, and I was one of a hundred of them in this large company. And I went through a leadership program, an eight month leadership program, and the facilitator pulled me aside. She saw potential in me and she said, you need to start reporting to a vice president in this company. And I said, okay, because I reported <laughs> to a senior manager. All right. So I found a vice president in the company and asked her to be my mentor. And seven months later, a position opened on her team. She had met with me once a month. I volunteered to help as an operations manager. Most of the training in the company was for our operations people. They were 80% of our roles in the company. So as a manager, I knew the bread and butter of the business in operations. So I volunteered to teach their customer service course once a quarter, review their customer service materials and give feedback from real world in the trenches with our customers. I had to take all the angry customer escalation calls. Oh. <laughs> I want to speak to a manager. That's a job. <laughs> so what happened was seven months after that, facilitator gave me that advice. I then got moved into the learning and development organization, reporting to the vice president who reported to the president of the company. I went from being one of a hundred managers to having a skip level to the president in a 5,000 person company. Wow. So I had access to knowledge in that organization. It, it just launched my career through the roof and enabled me to do the work I do today. And that was mentoring that mm. opened that door for me. That's amazing. I actually can't recall if I mentioned that part of your background regarding your um, experience um, within a Fortune 20 company, but you've been everywhere. Uh, <laughs> thank you for sharing that story. Mm -hmm. On that same topic, um, I see a question came through from Marie. How do you find somebody to mentor if you feel like you're not experienced enough or convince someone that you are experienced enough? I love this question. <laughs> You can learn something from anyone. I have a 22-year-old son who teaches me things every single day that I didn't know because I'm 30 years older than him. And so he knows things about technology. I know that's a stereotype that, you know, I'm, I'm 51 and it's a stereotype that people don't know anything about technology. But for me, it's true. <laughs> and I'm not great with technology. And so you can learn something from anyone. So you can join a formal mentoring program where it could be a nonprofit and they'll pair you up and they do the work of figuring out what are skills and experiences you've had. Even if you've gone through the process of applying and getting into college, there are high school students who are shaking in their boots about 
how do I even manage this process? Because it's overwhelming, especially if you have to apply for financial aid. You can even giving them the tip, apply to more than one college or the scholarship offer will be because they they ask you, how many schools did you apply to? And if you say just you, oh, OK, no scholarship money for you mm. or we'll give you the very bare minimum. People don't know things like this. And I learned yeah. this going through the process with my two oldest. So yeah. you always have something of value because you know things that other people don't know and you have natural talents and skills. Remember those natural talents you have. If if I'm a very uh, inward facing person with my strengths, I get results and I think, but I'm not really good with influencing people and building relationships. And you are, you can give me a lot of advice and tips on how to work more successfully with people. Or if you're all relationship all day long and you never get anything done, people who are really good at creating routines and structure to get results can help you. You always have something to offer. It's It doesn't matter how old you are. Oh. You mentor children. You can mentor. My daughter is almost 10. She really needs a mentor. She's <laughs> so hungry to learn and grow as a person and having mom as your mentor is kind of lame. So I think that she would be, I really should get her involved in something where a teen mentors her. Anytime a teen girl or up to like 25 comes into her house, she's like magnet to them. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Well, thank you for sharing that. Um, so without knowing, you actually put in a plug for digital page because that's exactly what we do with that, with mentorship. That is true. Good connected. point. Yes. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> um, so moving on to a separate but very similar topic, because with the function of digital page, we are focused on underrepresented, underrepresented groups and communities. So my question for you here is, what are some common challenges that women and other underrepresented groups in, face in the workplace? And how can resources like UMAP or other frameworks like that help address these challenges? I love that question. So I am what is called Haudenosaunee. Haudenosaunee it was known as the Iroquois people. I'm specifically Mohawk. Mm -hmm. And when I say that to you, when I say I'm Mohawk, things are going to come to mind. Like, did my ancestors scalp people? And, mm -hmm. you know, all of these things. There are stereotypes yeah. that underrepresented people face. You may think that my family are all alcoholics. You may think that we don't work. There's a lot of negative stereotypes about indigenous Native American people, right? So I would say that, for example, in my family, my mother was born in 1945, and she was one of the youngest. Her siblings were born in the 1930s. And of the nine of them, they had 13 college degrees. And that would probably shock you that nine kids would hold 13 college degrees, including a medical doctor in that group from anyone born from the thirties to the forties. Yeah. Some of them were born in the, in the late twenties, actually, mm -hmm. let alone <clears throat> uh, a group of indigenous people. Right. Yeah. So I would say the biggest challenge that we have are assumptions and stereotypes yeah. And so what you want to do is really understand yourself and the value that you bring so that you can become an individual and not be not have assumptions. I mean, this happens for people who are older workers too. mature workers get the ageism stuff. Well, they're not going to be interested in learning. They're not going to be flexible. All of these different things. I think that's that's just how our brains categorize people. So you want to break free of these stereotypes people have and really know how to present yourself as an individual so that people forget those stereotypes and look at you as a unique and distinct individual. That's the best advice I can give you. Mm -hmm. So going through those exercises, discovering what's important to you, what were times that you were most satisfied, fulfilled, and happy, and what did you value about that? Why was that important to you? Really digging into what matters to you, asking people about the talents you have going through that ideal day and what are skills that you have that, that can, that can bring value. Even if you don't have a lot of experience, my, my 21, well, he just turned 22. He's just starting his first 
full-time job as a, as an analyst. And he went into a, a part-time job while he was still in college. And the, impl- the, the owner of the company started giving him experiences with client facing presentations, doing strategy work because my son knows his strengths and he's strategic mm-hmm. He's futuristic. He started confiding about the business and getting my son's feedback and input, even though he was a college student who had never had, I mean, he worked at Target. That was his last job before that. But he, he, he's at one time I was complaining to him about, I was working too many hours and dealing with too many clients. He said, why don't you, he was in high school. He said, well, why don't you raise your rates and see fewer people for the same amount of money? And I just looked at him. I said, that's like consulting 101. How did you know that? <laughs> And he said, well, it just seems like common sense, but he's strategic, right? You have that going on too. Not that exact talent, but you have things going on that are so easy to you. But here's the challenge, folks. People have told you those things are weaknesses. Mm. And because it's easy, it's not worth anything because you do it like breathing. It's not easy. Only one in 33 million people have your same top five strengths, remember, And it's not bad. The other person who said, you're a dreamer, you've got your head in the clouds because you were a visionary, or they say, you are too nosy. You ask too many questions because you're inquisitive. Or people say, you always have to be the center of attention because you are a natural presenter and communicator and you love to speak on a stage. Or you're too soft because you're high in empathy. Or you're too enthusiastic because you're a natural encourager. Or you're lazy because you are flexible and adaptable. Someday those skills are going to come in handy because you're going to be right where you need to be. But people didn't value those things in you because they don't have them. So they don't understand you. And people mean well by trying to make you just like them. (laughs) But you know what? There's already one of them. So we don't need... It's just amazing the advice you're going to get in your life based on other people's values. Do this job because it makes more money. And you don't care about money. You care about making a difference. I mean, you need to pay your bills, but you don't care about like making bank, (laughs) like my cousin. Um, there, There are things that people are going to tell you. Go into this job because it's got more security. Go in this job and you'll climb the ladder. Meanwhile, you want to be an expert and go deeper, not higher. So you have to stick to what's important to you or people are going to give you advice based on what's important to them. That is so important for us to intentionally unlearn all of these things we heard probably at least once a day growing up in how many years in the past. So thank you for sharing that. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned self-discovery a little bit. Um, we're all on this constant journey, I feel like, of self-discovery, but there's also changing responsibilities and your your uh, needs or interests are changing every day as well. So how can individuals balance the need for self-discovery and personal growth, but with the demands of their day-to-day lives and responsibilities? I would say that they should be integrated. Don't think of development as this thing I do over here academically, reading this book, listening Mm -hmm. to the audio book, but you can learn that way. I run and I listen to podcasts when I run and it inspires me for ideas to create social media content, listening to things and I spin it into new ways and I ask myself new questions. So how can you integrate? Use that commute wherever you're driving or listen to something while you're brushing your teeth or prop your cell phone in the shower and put on that, whatever your, if you Spotify your podcast or your Google podcast or whatever you do, listen to a podcast while you're taking a shower. Integrate. If you have an internship, if you have a job, look for opportunities for stretch projects or things you can do in that job, get paid to learn and grow. So don't think of it as these separate things, Mm. but integrate it wherever you can. That's my advice. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. I see one question here from the audience. Do you have any recommendations for defining where I want to be in five years? I love this question because I don't answer it well, but this comes from knowing yourself. So think about what your values are, right? What are your values? Let's say your values are, your number one value is um, community, and you want to work on building a community or joining a community and what's the impact you want to have. You, It's an opportunity to help someone understand who you are 
and how you want to leverage that more. So for example, let's just say you have a strength like, well, futuristic people don't have trouble answering this question because they think about where they want to be 20 years from now. But let's just say you're a live in the moment person. You can share, here are some of the goals I've set for myself. Don't know how to set goals? Write this down. What's going well in my life? You want to always start with the positives. Of what can I ex leverage and expand more? Well, I really enjoy doing this. Maybe I can do more of that. What could be different, better, or more of? It's a positive future focused way of looking at things that you want, where you want change. What's getting in the way? What are the barriers to those things that I want to be different, better, or more of? If you don't surface the barriers, you, like, for example, if someone says, well, I, one, of the, what's, one of the things isn't going well. I started my new job and I'm working my manager. I don't have time with my manager. I, I got a lot of confusion in my role. I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing. Well, what's the barrier? Well, my manager's door is always closed, <laughs> you know, and, and they don't respond to their email. So you have to surface the barriers because you can't, the solution can't be, well, I'll just meet with my manager more. Um, and then after you surface the barriers, you say, what's one change that I want to make? And then how can I help myself and what help do I need? That's the fifth question. The reason you have to ask those questions is because it helps you figure out, it's like a plus delta. Plus is what's going well and delta is what do I need to change? But you have to say what's the most important priority thing to change. Otherwise, you'll overwhelm yourself with a list of things you want to change. And research on goals says that if you set 10 goals, you'll probably achieve zero. If you set two, you'll probably achieve two. The more goals you set, the fewer you actually achieve. So if Tiny, ha Tiny Habits by BJ Fogg, Atomic Habits by James uh, Cleary, those are, gr clear, those are great books to read if you are interested in goal setting. Um, so I would just say... It's really important to know who you are so that you say, I'm looking for opportunities to do more of this, what your, where your talent lies, and in a way that aligns to my values of this. Now, it, it might sound like a cheat answering the question that way because you're not saying, I want to become a senior engineer <laughs> in whatever, but what you're doing is you're impressing someone with how well you know yourself. Mm. Self-awareness is the number one predictor of career success, according to Green Peak Partners research, self-awareness. Because why? People who know who they are don't take jobs that make them hate their life every day. They don't get into situations and settings. Like I've pretty much really enjoyed most jobs I've ever done because I've known my personality and my strengths from a very young age. Mm. So this is something that is a huge advantage to you. People end up in jobs. And I'm like, why are you here? This is a disaster. You don't belong here. I would say that as their manager. Let's get you somewhere better. I couldn't, I couldn't re resist it. Getting people out of places they didn't want to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> your, your skills and your natural abilities to see other people's strengths just kind of dive right in when you're having these conversations. Can't turn it off. People. Yeah, <laughs> which is great. And that goes back to the empathy required in most management roles or even or any role that deals with people, which is almost all of them. Mm -hmm. Socrates said, the unexamined life is not worth living. And I completely mm -hmm. subscribe to that. Yes. Love it. All right. Got one question here. So you have written extensively on the topic of emotional intelligence. So how do you see emotional intelligence fitting into the larger landscape of career development and success, similar to the topic of empathy? Required? Yeah, that, that is an excellent question. I am so glad that it was asked. So emotional intelligence is going to really help you with understanding your barriers. If you are, if you are doing really well in a job and it aligns to your strengths, values, skills, and interests and all that, great. But what if you're aligned to all those things and things are not going well? There are five elements that you have to look at. Your perception of self, so self-regard, emotional self-awareness, self-actualization. Assessments help you do that, right? Self-expression, that's your how assertive you are, how independent you are, how you express yourself emotionally. Um, 
that starts to affect your performance, right? How you express yourself. Are you very aggressive versus assertive? Are you cutting people off with your door closed as a manager? And your independence creates isolation. So independence is good, but when it creates isolation, it's not, right? You can overdo these things. You also have to look at your interpersonal skills, your social responsibility towards other people, your 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 empathy, how you interpersonally interact with people. How do you make decisions? Um, how do you solve problems? How do you have a grip on actual reality? Because some people make decisions. You're like, you are so far detached from reality right now. It's not even funny. How do you deal with impulse control, right, in decision making? And then you have your stress management. This is huge. How optimistic are you versus being pessimistic? How well do you tolerate stress? How flexible are you? Some people, when they're stressed, they're just like, lock it down. Everything's my way. So these can affect your career if you don't know how people perceive you when you walk into a room, if you don't know how people are impacted by you when you express yourself, if you don't know what it feels like to interpersonally engage with you, if you don't know how your decisions are thrown. My mother always said that, most people's lives are a product of the decisions they make. There are things that happen to people. Don't get me wrong, but a large, um, our lives are largely shaped by the decision. One little decision at a time leads to a life, right? And then how you're handling stress. If you're not aware of these things about yourself, there's an, um, there is a assessment called EQI2. EQ, the lowercase i, and the number two. EQI2 is a really good um, emotional intelligence. If you are someone who's having problems in your career, you're, the number one reason, so when I did my um, Disrupt HR talk, I mentioned in that talk the number one reason people get fired is actually personality problems. People are uncoachable. They don't get along with people. Most intervention co intervention coaching that executive coaches do. Intervention coaching is when you're being voluntold to go to coaching. Like you don't really want to be coached, but they need your expertise, but everyone hates working with you. That's almost always an emotional intelligence um, issue that people are having. So they don't know how they're being perceived, but you know what? Those people are often just frustrated. They're frustrated and it, it comes out that way. So I love to ask people in that situation, tell me what's frustrating you. They start singing like a bird because for the <laughs> first time they feel like they're the problem all the time. But for the first time, someone's actually interested in what's frustrating me. Are you frustrated? Look at that. If you're frustrated every day, you're probably coming across like that. It's very difficult to hide when people are frustrated. People are expert body language readers. We all are, even if we don't think so. It's how the no like and trust factor happens in a split second. You know someone's your people yeah. or not your people pretty quickly, right? It's reading body language that you don't even know you're reading. Yeah. That was a great question. They're all great questions, but I'm glad you asked that because emotional yeah. intelligence is really important for people who you feel like maybe interpersonally, that's why you're finding yourself unemployed over and over and over again. Yeah. It's important to be coachable. Yeah. Oh, that's great. It's important to be coachable. Also, I love all the analogies you've shared so far this session. Um, I was listening to uh, a podcast session where you were the guest on the podcast. Mm. Um, and I believe it was that one where you shared an analogy about people being inside a jar and not being able to see uh, the labels outside. Yeah, uh, it's hard to read the label yes. when you're inside the jar. Mm -hmm. We don't have an awareness. I remember one time when I was working at the University of Buffalo, I used to walk into a coworker's office on Monday morning and I'd just start talking about what we needed to get done that day. And her face and her neck would get all red and blotchy. And I thought, boy, isn't she an odd bird? Like, she, why is she always red and blotchy all the time? <laughs> I had no idea that barreling into her office and just like boom, 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 like that was putting her in fight, flight, freeze. It was me why she was blotchy. I was like, <laughs> just weirdly her skin is weird right. i was causing it <laughs> oh no that's that's major self-awareness issue that i'm sure you it just I didn't have it a little back bit then, so younger but yeah i have it in hindsight. <laughs> yeah <laughs> oh that's hilarious 
Well, we are almost at the top of the hour. I did want to see if you have any closing remarks or advice for anyone at any stage. And as you know, we have audiences who are students from high school or college students, uh, young professionals, mid-level, seasoned, all of it. I would say always trust your gut. If you're if you're looking, if someone is trying to tell you about a job they want to put you in and your gut is saying no, you're reading a job description and there's your gut going off. Uh, how many people do you know who say, boy, I'm so glad I ignored my gut about that. <laughs> no, there are never. a lot of neurons in your gut. And we actually make decisions with our head, heart, and gut. And sometimes when we're conflicted, our head is the place of creativity and logic. Our heart is the place of compassion for ourselves and others. And our gut is that, that instinct it's where courage is. Yeah. So what is the most creative, compassionate, courageous decision I could make? Assess all three and make that decision. But don't don't ignore that gut because people, they ignore it. And they're like, I had a bad feeling about this and I did it anyway. And now I'm like splat on the floor. Right. <laughs> and even in hindsight, you don't think about those moments the next time you have to listen to your gut. So that's something we have to uh, bring into practice. For sure. Absolutely. Well, that brings us to the end of our fireside chat, Kristen. Thank you so much. And I'll have Amita close up. Thank you again. That was incredible. And I was jotting down notes um, as you were speaking. And I have to say, I've got a few that I'm walking away with strategizing because nobody really thinks about strategizing for yourself. Um, raising your hand and just putting yourself out there. I could not underline and repeat that one enough. So if you are, regardless any point of your career, and if you're thinking that there's more that you want to do, raise your hand and let them know. It's the only way you may get the opportunity. Um, advocating for yourself, it's a tough one, but you have to do it. Um, volunteer work counts as skills, as transferable opportunities. And speaking from myself, my own experience, I took almost 10 years off and I changed kind of career paths and went into an industry that I'd never worked in before. And I questioned, my God, am I going to fit in here? And it is those transferable skills. And it was the conversation of, no, I wasn't just at home, you know, doing whatever, taking care of children and even taking care of children. You, you learn skills. Let me repeat that one. So whatever you're doing in life, you are walking away with a skill that you can use elsewhere. So remind yourself of the value that you're gaining. And then um, just overall, all of these anal analogies that you shared, I, you know, we got great feedback on them. So thank you, Kristen. Wealth of information um, that I know will we'll have a lot of people looking to engage with it and go back and probably read your book. <laughs> um, and to all of our viewers, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, quick shout out, keep in touch with Digital Page. We've got a data and analytics hackathon coming up. So if you are interested in that as a career path that you're looking to pivot into it or just learn more about, definitely register. And if you are local to the Charlotte area this fall, we're going to have an amazing program um, partnering up with the CMS school district. So if you know any students there that are looking to pursue something in the tech industry, have them look up um, what we're doing and we'd love to have them join in. Um, enjoy the rest of your afternoon. And again, thank you, Rashmili, and thank you, Kristen, for your time and that amazing conversation. Thank you. Thank you all.